it's a pleasure to have our own Serge Dietrich here today to give the seminar, as he is here many days, but not always giving the seminar. Uh, so Serge came to us from Georgia State, but he's not a total stranger to the Washington area. He got his, he, he grew up in, in the U.S. and Brazil. He got his uh, undergraduate degree from Johns Hopkins University. And while he was there, he was an undergraduate intern at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and then also got his start in the study of brown dwarfs at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, working with Dave Golomowski. So he then taught physics for a couple of years, and uh, then went on to get his PhD at Georgia State, working with Todd Henry on low mass stars and, and brown dwarfs, which you'll hear more about, so I won't steal his thunder on that. Uh, and then he was awarded a National Science Foundation Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellowship to come here and has been here since last September. So that fellowship is one of the more interesting ones in astronomy from the standpoint of its, um, re its requirements because it asks fellows to do both outstanding research and outstanding, um, uh, what do they call it? Education. Education. Or, um, education yeah. programs. And so <laughs> Serge obviously had a lot of experience uh, from that, uh, from his time teaching, and he is working on developing curricular materials for the teaching of physics as his education component of that. Um, but it's been a delight to have him here working in what is now kind of a large little brown dwarf, large little brown dwarf, <laughs> <laughs> little star group um, on the astronomy floor. And so uh, thanks for joining So first of all, can, this is on. Can you all hear me? I don't think it's on. Maybe the sound is on. I don't think it turned it on, so it's probably not. Here we go. It's in the off position. Okay. Now. Now. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge some outstanding collaborator, collaborators, both here and uh, across water places. Uh, you know most of these people here. Uh, Andrew has been working with me this summer, has been a lot of help, and we'll discuss a lot of his work here. Uh, Jonathan, who is uh, going to be starting here in September, is going to be part of our little brown dwarf cluster that uh, Alicia was talking about. And I am a member of the RECON team, which is, uh, stands for Research Consortium on Nearby Stars. And uh, it is an inter-institution team that is uh, headquartered at Georgia State University, but it is uh, all over the world now. So as not all of us here are astronomers, and as, as I have uh, teaching in, in my blood, uh, let's just start with uh, a little bit of basics about stellar structure and what it is that, that we're addressing here. Uh, so stars are uh, really simple compared to planets and, and brown dwarfs. Uh, you have a cloud of interstellar dust and it collapses. Uh, eventually under the collapse, uh, temperature and pressure get high enough that you ignite hydrogen fusion in the core, and then you reach uh, a stable equilibrium between heat from hydrogen fusion holding against the pressure of gravity uh, that, that's <coughs> trying to bring it in. Uh, and at that point, the stars are actually very stable, most of them. Uh, while the hydrogen supply does not run out, they are basically unchanged or change very little. Uh, this could be only a few million years for the most massive stars. Uh, for the sun, uh, we believe it's about 10 billion years. We're about the halfway point right now, so uh, hurry up, everyone. Uh, and for the smallest stars that we're going to talk about here, it is hundreds of billions of years, if not even trillions of years. So the, the, the take home point here is that none of the stars that we'll be talking about here have evolved past or their mature phase or their adult phase yet. Uh, the universe is simply not that old for that to have happened yet. So uh, a tool you may be familiar with is the HR diagram. This is the basic diagram for uh, stellar studies. Uh, 
In keeping with astronomical tradition, the uh, x-axis is reverted. You have uh, temperature here with the hottest being on this side and coolest on this side. And this is luminosity, which is just a, a word for what in physics we would call power, uh, the, the total light output per unit time of the star. Uh, one way to remember this axis inversion here is that if you do it by wavelength, it works out. You start with bluer stars, which are shorter wavelengths. So uh, most of the stars, about 90%, if not more, of the stars in the universe fall in this strip here that we call the main sequence. Uh, you have giants and white dwarfs, which we won't talk about today. Uh, these are actually what we call the dwarf stars as well. Uh, in terms of terminology, this is relevant. Uh, Pluto, that we heard a lot this week, is a dwarf planet that is not considered a planet. Well, a dwarf star is every much bit a star. Uh, it is just one of the main categories, dwarfs as opposed to giants. And about 90% of the stars fall in the dwarf range. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the very tail end here. But uh, one of the things that we get from this diagram is that there is incredible diversity in uh, stellar populations. Not all of them are alike. In uh, mass, you have a factor of basically 1,500. In luminosity, you have a factor of actually 1 billion, if you include the rarest, very, very bright stars and the smallest one we're going to be talking about today. Uh, about 12,000 in radius, and surface temperature can range anywhere from 2,100 to about 30,000 Kelvin. And remember, uh, energy output goes as the fourth power of uh, surface temperature. So the, this is why we get this crazy variation in, in luminosity of a billion. So let's focus on uh, what we call the solar neighborhood, the immediate stars around us. Uh, this is a classic diagram by uh, my advisor, Todd Henry. And what we see here is here's the sun, and then there is a coordinate system that you, you may or may not be able to see. But at first sight, when you look at the 25 nearest stars, you have some big dots that dominate the scene. Uh, the, the sizes of the stars here are roughly to scale with their radius. So you um, have all these really bright ones. Uh, this is Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. But then if you look closely, you see that by numbers, we are dominated by the little red ones that we call the red dwarfs or M dwarf stars. In fact, 18 out of the 25 stars in this diagram, or roughly 70%, are M dwarfs. Uh, for reasons that are not yet fully understood, nature vastly prefers the formation of very small stars as opposed to, to bigger stars. This diagram here is a little outdated now, but this is the population of known stars within uh, 10 parsecs, which is uh, roughly 32 light years. And the, the blank spaces here just represent unpublished results as of the date of that. And you see that when you get to the M dwarfs, their population skyrockets, and then it precipitously falls. Uh, it used to be that people would believe that this fall here was just due to observational bias, to incompleteness. Uh, it is becoming more and more clear that that is actually a real effect, and that is one of the things that we're going to be exploring here today. So this tailwind of the HR diagram is uh, arguably the least understood part of the main sequence. Uh, mostly because at this point, you have to uh, start wondering whether the conditions are actually right for hydrogen fusion. 
whether that uh, stellar ignition that we took for granted for more massive stars, whether that is actually going to happen or not. Uh, and that is actually what I did my thesis work on was uh, observations of which objects uh, will ignite as stars and which objects won't. And the work that I'm doing here is actually just a continuation of, of that work. Um, so what happens if a star does not have enough temperature and pressure, which is a, a proxy of mass, uh, then it forms what we call a brown dwarf, which uh, you can think in, in colorful terms as the cooling embers of the, the stellar formation process. You know, the, the coals that never really caught fire, and yet they have enough initial energy that they will shine very faintly for uh, a period of time. Uh, they're always cooling, so uh, they don't have a main sequence. Uh, and because they're not sustained by hydrogen fusion, their cores are actually degenerate, which makes their radius an inverse function of mass. Uh, the more massive a brown dwarf you have, essentially the tighter you're packing its inside and the smaller it gets. Uh, an analogy I like to use here is, is a spring. If you have like a, a, a car suspension spring, you press it onto here, the more pressure you put in it, the smaller it's going to get. However, when you compare them to the very low mass stars uh, observationally with what we can actually see through the telescope, you have a problem because they, they are at first almost undistinguishable. They are both small, roughly uh, the size of Jupiter, which is about 10% the radius of the Sun. Uh, their atmospheres are very, very complex because these are low entropy systems where you can actually form molecules and dust grains and all sorts of things that will give you a very nasty spectrum. And while they still retain some of that primordial heat, they shine with basically the same luminosity as the lowest mass stars. Uh, you may have heard of spectral types in astronomy. The M dwarfs are the stars we're talking about earlier. That, uh, about 70% of the stars are M dwarfs. And then more recently, they've developed the spectral types L, T, and only a few years ago, Y, uh, which represents these very, very cool uh, brown dwarfs and, and stellar mixes. We're going to be talking about the L dwarfs today, uh, which is a mix of uh, very low mass stars, young to adolescent brown dwarfs, and also very young planetary, object, planetary mass objects. So what are some of the key questions that I'm trying to address here? Uh, where is the end of the stellar main sequence? Uh, that is probably the biggest question that I, I've addressed in my thesis and I continue to address now. Uh, if you look at an object, can you say whether that object will uh, you know, continue burning hydrogen for the remainder of its life or whether it is a brown dwarf that has entered the cooling curve? The brown dwarf cooling is uh, way too slow for us to observe in, in human lifetimes. So they are fairly constant for the, from the point of view of observation. Um, how, do, how well do the models work for this? It, it turns out and sometimes much better than other times. Uh, what are the effects of varying the chemical composition? Uh, remember for us astronomers, anything that's higher than, than helium in, in atomic number is a metal. It's just that, that simple. The, the universe is composed of hydrogen, helium, and metals. Um, and as an overarching theme, how do we relate what we can actually observe, which are the properties of the stellar surface, to what is actually going on inside the star? This question of hydrogen ignition uh, is, is an interior question. We cannot, we cannot see that. We can just uh, relate it by model-wise. Uh, this is uh, a classic diagram in this study. It's by uh, Adam Burroughs, who uh, 
some of you may remember from the, the review we had a while ago. And on this axis, we had logarithmic age with one billion years being right here. On this axis, we have luminosity. And the blue lines represent the um, evolution of stars. And you see that eventually they enter the main sequence here. The brown lines are the evolutions of planets. They just form, or planetary mass objects, I should say, even if they're free floating. Uh, they just form and cool constantly. And the massy green lines are the brown dwarfs. They have an initial burst of deuterium burning right here. It turns out in the overall energy budget that burst of deuterium is almost negligible for uh, the, the later development of the star. And right here, you see that the stars and the brown dwarfs are beginning to separate. So that is the region of interest in, in luminosity time space that we would like to address if we're going to make sense of which is which here. Um, the fact that we're dealing with these ages of a billion years or more means that these objects have left their stellar nurseries and they are distributed more or less evenly throughout the sky, which uh, observationally makes it very difficult because I cannot point the telescope at a particular nebula or a particular cloud and say I'm going to study all the objects there and make sense of it. I actually have to hunt for these objects throughout the entire sky. Uh, now because our observatory is in the southern sky, uh, we, we're limited to that and so basically we do the southern hemisphere and multiply the results by two. Um, so it turns out, we talked a little bit about radius first, uh, it turns out the radius trends are going to be instrumental here in tackling this question. Uh, what we see here is the uh, same data from before in the Burroughs diagram, just rearranged with radius as an explicit variable. Uh, this is mass in terms of Jupiter mass. And anything more massive than about 75 Jupiter masses is theoretically thought to be a star. And uh, the radius behavior is pretty simple. You know, the smallest ones have smallest radius. Then I mentioned earlier the brown dwarfs have an inverse radius function. Well, you put them to, to the two relations together and you have a radius minimum right here at the stellar substellar boundary. Uh, you should also know that the, the four lines here are for different ages. Uh, I think the ages are uh, half a billion, one billion, three and five billion. And uh, for stars, of course, we expect uh, older ages because uh, these stars, once they form, they're around forever. They, they don't evolve past the main sequence. The, this population of the galaxy is thought to be anywhere between 3 to 10 billion years uh, as, as far as the spread goes, uh, depending on who you ask. But 3 to 5 billion years is a good age guess if you were to just reach in a box and pick up a star. Uh, you, you'd probably be more, more right than wrong by assigning 3 to 5 billion years. Uh, So if we could somehow uh, observationally detect this radius minimum here, uh, then we could really address the question of where this boundary between stars and brown dwarfs is. Um, so how do you do radius? You put the stars in the HR diagram. Once you have luminosity and temperature, by the Stefan-Boltzmann law, you can get radius easily. Um, so what do you have to do? to actually uh, put a star in the HR diagram. You need to start with some guess as to what the overall flux of the star is going to be. We call that the spectral energy distribution, going anywhere from visible light to the mid-infrared uh, in uh, wavelengths of uh, 
we stop at about 20 microns or so. Most of these objects will peak in the very near infrared, about one to two microns. Um, once we have this initial gas from a molecule, you need, from a model, I mean, you need to actually observe uh, photometry. You need to observe how much light is coming from the star at different wavelengths so that you can calibrate that initial gas. And uh, you need to break the uh, brightness distance degeneracy. So you actually need to know the precise distance to the star. Uh, the only way of doing that empirically is through the trigonometric parallax method that we'll be talking more about soon. And then once you have all that, you also need a hold on the stellar temperature. And that, again, we have to go to atmospheric models to make sense of them. So here's what the spectral energy distribution of a typical Eldorf looks like. Uh, this is in log space here. Uh, astronomers like to work in different color bands that are just the, the result of putting different filters on the telescope. Uh, VRI are uh, considered optical, which is a loose term for visible light wavelengths. Uh, then JHK through W3 are infrared bands. Uh, those were done by uh, two all sky surveys that uh, observed the entire sky, one of them from the ground, the other one from space, the ground satellite, the, the WISE satellite. However, if we really want to get a good hold on temperature, we need to worry about the wing tail of this distribution here. Uh, remember from black body physics, the blue part of a black body is the one that's going to vary the most with temperature. And uh, so what I had to do for this project is go to the telescope and actually observe a sample of those stars in visible light. Uh, where they are actually very, very faint. Uh, this is, uh, V is roughly greenish yellow light, uh, R is uh, far red, and I, even though it is uh, detectable by CCD detectors, is beyond the range of the human eye, so you could call it the, the very near infrared. Um, so for photometry, uh, I'm actually, for my thesis work, I used uh, a different observatory, but I'm gonna be talking about the tools that are available to Carnegie here and that, that we're using at Carnegie. Uh, there are basically four telescopes at Las Campanas Observatory that are regularly used by Carnegie. The smallest one is the SWOPE telescope. This is a one meter telescope. Uh, when we talk about telescope sizes, we're actually talking about their diameters, the diameter of the primary mirror, which tells you how much light you're collecting. Uh, even though it is a small telescope, it is surprisingly powerful because it has a very sensitive camera attached to it. And so when we do photometry, we basically look at a star, look at a standard, compare the two, and do that all night long. Then once we have the photometry for the stars, we go back to that initial gas for the spectral energy distribution, and we calibrate it by doing synthetic photometry on this flux and uh, doing an iterative corrective process where we compare each region uh, of the synthetic photometry to the observed photometry. We calculate a corrective factor. Uh, we tie all the corrective factors with a polynomial uh, so as to, to have continuity, and we multiply the star for uh, the, the, the initial SCD by that polynomial, and we iterate until we have a very good match to the photometry. See, in this first case, um, you have the initial gas and the final result superimposed, and you almost cannot see the difference in this case, you see that the end result was actually a little bit redder, a little bit more flux in the red than the initial result was. Uh, this is a method that can be considered empirical because even though we are 
starting with a model gas, we are calibrating that gas to uh, arbitrarily good precision. In, in, in this case, we used about 2% uh, match, which is the precision of our photometry to, to begin with. Uh, so determining effective temperature, uh, it, if you are an astronomer in the audience, uh, you might be interested in, in reading this. If not, I'll just tell you that we've compared synthetic colors to model colors, and we did a, a minimization method to actually get what the, the, the best model-dependent temperature is. Uh, there is no way around the fact that getting temperatures are going to be model-dependent, uh, depending on atmospheric models. Uh, we, there is no direct way of doing this. So later on, we're going to talk a lot about whether these assumptions for temperature are right or not. And then distance, uh, you all may have heard trigonometric parallax, which is the apparent, which is determining distance based on the apparent motion of a star uh, due to Earth's actual motion. Uh, even though uh, all astronomers show cartoons like this, I kind of hate it because it gives the impression that it's actually easy, which it isn't. Uh, this, you cannot do this with just two observations. You will take uh, you know, anywhere from 6 to 15 different observations spaced out over the period of one and a half to two years. Uh, you need to deconvolve the fact that not only you have uh, this reflex motion, but the star is moving throughout the galaxy in, in different ways. And that motion, we call the proper motion, is usually a straight line motion that is uh, embedded in this motion as well. And so this is a typical trigonometric parallax image. Uh, this is what I use for my thesis in uh, the old way of doing it. Uh, here at Carnegie, we do it with a much more powerful way that we'll discuss soon. But if you look at star label number 12 here, this is the science star for which we want to determine the distance. And the assumption is that this star is much closer to us than the other uh, stars. And so if we measure, if we consider the other stars to be almost fixed in space, and we measure the wobble of this star relative to the other ones, we can get the parallax. Um, this, this motion happens at the very sensitivity of our ability to measure it. Uh, you actually need to center that star to a precision much better than one pixel. Uh, a lot of people ask, how can you do uh, a centering to better than a pixel in an image? The answer is that for astronomers, images through the telescope are actually three-dimensional structures. Uh, most people that deal with images care a lot about the shapes that we're seeing. Uh, what we actually care about the flux. Uh, the flux is the third dimension for us. So these are representations of what a star looks like when we actually analyze an image. And you can see that the flux is actually distributed in a three-dimensional Gaussian shape. Uh, we call this the point spread function, which is if you have an, an unresolved point of light, how much does telescope optics and the atmosphere blur that so that you have this distribution. And once you have data like this, you can just fit a Gaussian to it, and the centroid of that mathematical function is going to be what we call the centroid of that particular star. So that is how we get around the, the pixelation, as it's called, issue, the, the fact that pixels are discrete quantities. So this is what typical parallax ellipses look like. Uh, let's focus on the first one here. As Earth traveled on its orbit, the reflex motion that we saw for this particular star traces out a little ellipse in the sky. The, we only see half of it because for the other half, the star is behind the sun. So it would be great if we could see both halves, but we have to do with half. Uh, notice how many dots you have here to constrain that ellipse. Uh, it turns out that the cartoon version, which gives you this dot, and that dot, uh, 
there's a lot to lower your errors. Uh, the, the further out you are towards the edges here, the better off you are. But you cannot just simply, just simply use those two. Uh, you can connect a straight line through any two points, and that doesn't, doesn't tell you much. Uh, as you see, depending on their position in the sky, the shape of uh, the ellipse is going to be a little different. Here, they're all normalized to be the same size, but uh, the further away ones would have a, a smaller overall ratio, uh, overall size. So how do we do it here at DTM? Uh, we use an instrument called CAPSCAM, which is the, the brainchild of uh, Alan Boss, Alicia, and several other people. Uh, CAPSCAM was designed to look for uh, giant-sized planets around uh, very low-mass stars, but it turns out that it is a very good parallax machine as well. Uh, in order to look for these giant planets, which is what Alan's interested on, uh, first you need to take the parallax, and then once you subtract the parallax motion, if you still see any other perturbations, then that can be indicative of a camera, of a, a planet going around that star. It is mounted on the DuPont two and a half meter telescope. Uh, here's an image of it actually hanging on the bottom of the, the telescope. Uh, it is not permanently mounted when we put in our proposals every six months. Uh, usually what they do is they get everyone who wants to use CAPSCAM and put them on the schedule right next to one another. And then for about a week or so at a time, they will go and actually mount CAPSCAN on the telescope. And that week, you, you actually may be seeing very few of us cap scanners here because we're working at night. Uh, conveniently, we can do these observations actually from, from here, remotely. So this is a picture taken from my office of what the computer screen looks like when I'm observing. You see that this field here is a lot richer than the one I was showing you previously. And that gives us many, many more choices as to which reference stars to use. Uh, we're actually probing uh, fainter, which means that most likely we're looking at more distant stars for the reference stars. So that assumption that these stars don't move is uh, a better assumption. And Gilliam, who's here, actually uh, wrote the pipeline for processing these data. And whereas before I had to manually pick which stars I wanted to uh, use for reference stars, there are so many here that Gilliam's pipeline essentially picks them for us and just, you know, does the entire process. Uh, so, um, as I said, this is done from here. Uh, and if you would like to uh, help keep us awake at night, uh, please come. The next time I'll actually do it from Las Campanas because I'll happen to be there for other reasons. But uh, late September, I think I have two nights and Jackie has a night in the middle of that. Uh, as I told uh, Andrew, who, who came in the beginning of the night, uh, once you see this for half an hour or so, uh, you pretty much seen it. It <laughs> goes on for, for the rest of the night. Uh, so we have all these data. How do we know that the methodology is right for uh, building an HR diagram? Uh, we cannot directly measure the radii of these stars that we're after. They, they are simply too faint and too small. But we can directly measure the radii for slightly brighter and more massive stars. Uh, that can be done either through interferometry, or it can be done when you have an eclipsing binary system. Eclipsing binaries, in theory, could work for our science targets as well. It's just that it has not been done yet. Uh, so we apply this technique to slightly brighter stars, and we get a pretty good correlation. We get errors of about 3% or more. Uh, you can see kind of a pattern here, but uh, then the smallest one is actually right on. And a collaborator of mine is working at another one that is actually somewhere around over here. Uh, 
Zwolf 359 for the astronomers uh, Daddy Boyajin is working on that and I'm very anxiously waiting that result uh -huh. so now that we have all these data we can actually calculate the HR diagram um, remember I said earlier that we would focus just on this very tiny part at the end here uh, this is my thesis result it is really an extension and an enrichment of what we knew right down here. Uh, the HR diagram includes radius information, but it is implicit on these variables. Uh, lines of constant radii run diagonal to the diagram here. However, if we rearrange the diagram so as to make radius an explicit variable, we get some patterns coming out. Uh, we see a sequence here, which looks very much like the main sequence we talked about earlier. Uh, you see a minimum in radius here at about 0.06 uh, solar radii. And then you see a jump in radius as luminosity gets fainter and fainter. You also see this other trend here, uh, the circled stars are known binary stars that are so close to one another that we cannot deconvolve them. So uh, there's a chance that we may be getting, well, for the known binaries, we know that we're getting more flux than uh, what a single star would emit. So for the ones that are not circled, there is a chance that they are binaries and we have not uh, deconvolved them yet. Or they could be very, very young brown dwarfs that, uh, not in that adolescent phase, but still 100 million years or less, that still have not cooled enough. So let's compare that to that original diagram I showed you of, uh, of theoretical stellar radii. Uh, remember, here we have the stars, and here we have the brown dwarfs and planets area. You connect this area here as being the smallest possible stars that we observe. Notice here that we are on the uh, older lines, of the three and five giga year lines there. And that makes sense for stars because stars, once they form, they hang around at these masses uh, forever, really. If we go on, we see another trend here where you have less massive objects, less luminous objects as well, even though this axis is uh, mass, uh, it does translate to luminosity. The, the lower mass you have in a brown dwarf, the least luminosity you're going to have, the faster that cooling curve is going to be. And so we have a pretty good correlation of what theory expects as far as detecting two populations there. So that is a, a very good indication that we may actually have found the end of the main sequence, of the stellar main sequence. And we know that those two stars here are representatives of the smallest stars that may exist. Uh, in fact, one in particular, 2 mass 0523, is the, the smallest radius star there. And uh, when this came out, I was contacted by Scientific American, and they told me, can you provide a color picture? I said, no, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't work in colors, we don't. And, and particularly in order to, to get a color image, you would need a blue filter, a blue light, uh, which we don't use because these objects are essentially invisible in, in blue light. But I know we really, really want this color picture. Is there anything you can do? I said, okay. So I put the different filters together, uh, this is what I came up with. Uh, the scholar is completely artificial, but it is there. Uh, it is true that this star is probably very red. Eldorfs tend to be a maroonish red color, a, a very deep red. Uh, and a very interesting thing is that by a coincidence, the radius we got for this star turned out to be almost exactly the radius of the planet Saturn. Uh, so you may have heard earlier people say that the smallest stars are Jupiter-sized. Uh, we can actually go a step further now and say that the smallest stars are actually 
Saturn size. Now, Saturn and Jupiter are only different by about 15% in, in radius, but still it is a nice coincidence that it is so, so close there. Uh, the surface temperature of 2100 Kelvins, uh, luminosity roughly 110 thousandths of the sun, and it is a winter sky object in Lepus, right under uh, Orion the Hunter, which is probably the most easily recognized constellation out there. This would be fine and dandy if it were not for the chorus of complaints that I got from the theorists. Um, it turns out that when you look at stellar models, uh, stellar evolutionary models, uh, they predict that the smallest possible star would actually be much fainter and much cooler. Uh, what we're seeing here is the same radius luminosity diagram. What I have superimposed here are what we call the evolutionary tracks for different masses. We start with 0.09 solar masses here, and then we go up and up. Uh, don't worry so much about the open circles. They're, those are just indications of the ages along that track. And you can see that for the mass that is theoretically believed to be the end of the main sequence, the track stops over there. And we found the lowest mass around here. Uh, so a lot of what I'm doing here at DTM is actually trying to figure out, uh, A, who, who is right and who's wrong. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have nature on my side because I am the, the observer. When this actually came out, I, I, I looked at Johanna, my office mate, and said, like, you know what, this is, uh, you know, Alan, who's, who is, well, only half a theorist nowadays because he does a lot of <laughs> Sparallax stuff. He's been instrumental in getting me here, but I would hate to be a theorist because you're always wrong. So, uh, you're, you're, you know, and, and it only takes one graduate student with a telescope to tell you whether you're, you're, you're right. Or wrong. Uh, so what is going on here? Can we make sense of this discrepancy? What we have here are the predictions of several different models, not just the ones that, that I showed you, for what this theoretical star at the very end of the main sequence would look like. I'm actually going to read some of these. Uh, the masses range anywhere from uh, 0.076 to 0.07 solar masses. The uh, surface temperature goes anywhere from 1900 to 1700 Kelvin. And again, the one we got was close to 2100. The luminosity is likewise much lower for all the models. However, radius is thought to change very little with metallicity and with the opacity of the stellar atmosphere. And for radius, our value is actually right on. It is actually the average of all the other models. So that is a good indication that perhaps something is wrong with the opacities of those atmospheres, which gives you an indication of how much the heat that's trying to escape from the star is actually fed back into the interior of the star. It's essentially uh, an analogy that I like to use here is that if you're cold and you're shivering because your body's trying to produce, produce heat to keep you warm, you put a blanket on, you're not going to have to work as hard to produce that heat to keep you warm. And therefore, you would actually be able to sustain the hydrogen fusion at lower temperatures because you don't need your furnace, to, to your nuclear furnace, to work as hard. That is a, a very rough analogy. If, if you're an astronomer and you're cringing, that's okay. Um, so there are something that the models predict that is empirical. They predict the colors for those stars, which is actually something that I can observe through the telescope, uh, no ifs, ands, and buts. It is, it, it, it is not model dependent. So what we see here is a variety of different color combinations use different filters. And the triangles are uh, the empirical data that I got for uh, 
very low mass stars and, and brown orbs. Uh, we see that they actually form a sequence. And what we're getting from the models is a very different sequence. You get a sequence that goes this way, gets substantially redder, remember red is towards this end, gets substantially redder, which means cooler, uh, more opaque, uh, that, that blanket that you're wearing just got thicker, than the stars that we see. And then it turns around here and puts the hydrogen burning limit in a spot that observationally is unattainable. I could, you know, there's, seeing the sequence here, there is just no way that I can put a star in that position. They are, uh, these sequences are pretty much well behaved. Uh, what we're doing here is we're trying to extend this sequence and I will bet anything you want to bet that it will not turn around and do this. It will continue, it, it may curve one way or the other, but it will continue roughly like this. So this again tells us that there is something wrong with the opacity of the models. Um, if the stars were actually as red as the models are predicting, if they had that extra blanket of opacity on, then yes, they could possibly shine at stars at much cooler temperatures because they, they are preserving more of that internal heat. But it turns out they don't. It turns out stars uh, seem to get rid of their energy in a much easier way than the models are predicting. So uh, this just came out uh, a few months ago and uh, we, we actually had what was probably the most epic journal, astronomy journal club discussion here on this campus about this model because uh, Jackie, who also does Brown Dwarfs, and I were actually very, very heated about the fact that uh, these data were public. I had already published this and the, the model author, who, whose name I will not mention, uh, did not care to address this issue. So now at least when someone says, well, the models predict something else, well, the models also predict the location of the hydrogen burning limit in a place that's possible. So that's uh, one, one notch for our score. Mm -hmm. Sir, yes? Two questions on that. Uh-huh. One, I, I think I'm just getting a little bit confused going back to how you derive the data. I thought you said you basically fit SEDs and things using models to get the limit. Good point. So there are two types of models. There are atmospheric models, right. which are essentially given, uh, given the energy that the star is producing under that atmosphere will give you the emergent spectrum. Right. And there are evolutionary models that worry about it, really structure and evolutionary models. Sure, but the opacity the, must go into both of those, right? The opacity does go into both of those. Uh, however, the, the feedback mechanism between the two is something that, that can be debated as to uh, how much goes. It's just, it, it, uh, another question, I mean, you're not saying whose models these are. Are they the only existent models of this kind? Or They're supposedly the most advanced ones because they use the most advanced atmospheric okay. features. Uh, no, there are several groups working on those. Uh, on and are models. other models in better the other models were using older metallicities, so you can pretty much uh, expect them to be wrong in the sense that their assumptions for solar metallicity were uh, not okay. as okay. relevant. And you know better than anyone that uh, we still don't know that <laughs> the answer to, to that question, really. But this, what we're seeing here, is the result of evolutionary models. In order to test an evolutionary model, you actually need to know the masses of the systems, which are very difficult to get. In order to test an atmospheric model, all you need is a spectrum. And therefore, the evolutionary, mo the atmospheric models are much further along than the evolutionary models are. <coughs> so part two, is, uh, what remains to be done here? Uh, so some major questions that 
we're going to address is our approach to getting the masses, to getting the temperatures uh, from atmospheric models actually right? Uh, what will happen when we don't just pick a few stars out of the box, but we actually look rigorously at population properties? And uh, we actually see that initial slide about what nature is actually forming. What is, what is it giving us? And how can we relate these properties to mass, which I mentioned earlier is, is the most difficult part. Um, these are questions that are heavily observational. Uh, there are a few reasons why I chose DTM for uh, this work. Uh, first and foremost is you know, all you guys, the, the support and the environment that, that we get here. Uh, that really is the only reason. Uh, reason number two is telescope time. This is very important to, to have access to telescopes. Reason number three is telescope time, too. Uh, it, it is even more important to have access to multiple telescopes. You can probably guess reason number four. It is telescope time. And actually, there are three different telescopes that I'm using for this project. So therefore, the three reasons, uh, the Magellans, which you may be familiar with, which are the, the, the big guns of Carnegie Astronomy, the six and a half meter telescopes, are only a small part of this project. Uh, actually, most of the time I get is in the one meter the scope telescope, in which uh, time allocations are, are virtually unlimited. I can send an email to Carnegie Observatories and say, hey, I need this telescope at this time. And they're like, OK, just, just come down. Uh, it is really, especially at the postdoctoral level, it is amazing uh, the, the access to telescopes that we have here at Carnegie. Um, so how do we know that these radii are right? Uh, we could use spectroscopy to test these model atmospheres a lot better, as, as Larry was saying. Uh, it has been suggested that if the temperatures I'm getting for these objects here are too cold, then uh, the radius would be artificially inflated to compensate for the given luminosity. Uh, this is, in my view, unlikely because the, the change, the shift in temperature would have to be significant. <laughs> and as of last week, uh, very preliminary results that Andrew and I have, have done, um, mostly Andrew, indicate that our temperatures, if anything, uh, may be too hot, uh, meaning, that, uh, meaning that these things here may actually would go the other way, uh, would be even more elevated. Uh, so spectroscopy is done with the Magellan telescopes. Uh, there are a multitude of information in a spectra and to show just some examples of how we use spectra here. There are actually two spectrographs. One of them is MAGE, which is this box right over me. Uh, good thing it's well attached, uh, because it's very expensive. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be there. I mean, uh, 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 humans are self-healing. Uh, strong instrumentation is not. And there is actually FIRE, which is an infrared spectrograph. And, uh, Starting in a few months, they're actually going to be on the same telescope so that you can look at the same stars in two consecutive nights. You can use mage in one night and fire on the other one, and uh, that'll be really, really convenient. Uh, when you, the spectra actually comes out from the telescope, it looks very ugly. Uh, these are the different orders of uh, spectrum, and what you see is just different fluxes of light. And then it is uh, Andrew's job to actually make this uh, into something pretty and something that we can actually make sense of. And so this is what a spectra looks like when they're reduced. Uh, this is what was put out by the model atmosphere people to show how well the spectra actually work compared to real spectra. Uh, I wish them all worked that well. Of course, they, they picked the, the best ones to show. But uh, it's what we're doing is trying to make sense of just how well they work. Uh, the interesting thing about these spectra is that several of the uh, 
elements in the atmosphere are very sensitive to pressure, which is a proxy for gravity. So what we hear, what we have here is the sodium doublet lines in a spectrum. Uh, blue is uh, actual data, and we're comparing them to three different model spectra. We can see that the cyan one is a much better match, and that gives us an indication of what the surface gravity actually is in that atmosphere, and that can be linked to radius. So it's a further constraint, albeit a very loose one, on radius. Um, another inter is interesting thing regarding chemical composition is that if you see this box here on a temperature radius diagram, you have a region of mostly almost constant radius for the lowest stars, where temperature varies significantly. Uh, if you go back to that table I showed earlier, this is to be expected if you're varying the chemical composition. So one of the things we want to do is get spectra of uh, particularly the objects in this box and see if we actually have uh, a dispersion on the uh, temperature of the lowest possible star based on metallicity. Uh, so how do we test for metallicity? This is another one of Andrew's wonderful spectra. Uh, you can see the, the uh, blue one is the data here. We're superimposing them with three different model spectra. These jumps here, and again here, are caused by titanium oxide, which is a dominant molecule for these very cool atmospheres. Um, and you can see that the overall flux is a good indication of temperature. These are all for 3,000 Kelvin, these spectra. But when you're varying the metallicity, you get these things to be higher or lower. We still have not found a very good match for this particular spectrum, but we know from this sequence that this is probably a metal poor uh, spectra right there. Um, so importance of actually doing a volume complete sample uh, is this gap that we see here uh, real or not, or is it statistics of small numbers? Uh, recent observations predict that stars should outnumber brown dwarfs in the solar neighborhood by roughly six to one, uh, if, if not more. Uh, so we should, in a volume complete sample, expect to have a lot more objects here than around here. And the way we're doing that is we're just looking at field surveys and uh, with all that wonderful telescope time that we have now, particularly on the small telescope, the Swope telescope, we can uh, be very thorough about inclusion into the parallax survey of, of candidates that we believe are preliminarily nearby. And finally, we're also uh, working in getting dynamical masses tied to uh, these diagrams. I will uh, skip this in the interest of time, but uh, here are two spectra from objects that are actually two components of the same binary. So because we know their orbits, it is actually this one, because we have mapped the orbit of those two stars using the Hubble Space Telescope, we have very, very precise indications of their masses. And now we can go back at those evolutionary models that are difficult to test because you need masses. And you can actually try to make sense of a model that would fit not for one, but for both systems. Uh, as of two days ago, Andrew and I discovered that the only way to actually make both of these components fit the models is if this is a very young system. This uh, system turns out to be about 200 to 100 million years old, which is uh, sort of disappointing because now it is not in, in that uh, overall old population that we would like to address to see that. Um, so some final thoughts here. The pieces of the puzzle of this project are really coming together now that we can address them from multiple ways. 
Uh, model predictions for smaller stars are likely too cold and too faint. Uh, the existence of sky surveys now and the fact that we can follow up on those sky surveys is allowing us to actually reach completeness on our star sample. And spectroscopy is providing powerful tests of model atmospheres like I just showed. And uh, it is now possible to actually tie masses to those stars. And finally, I was uh, told by my fellow postdocs I would be in trouble if I uh, did not own up to my actions. So I know the, the geophysicists have a very adventurous life when you go on field work, but astronomy itself is, is not without its risks. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. Yes, John. So going back to the start of your talk, where you showed that histogram of the different spectral types, and you get a very rapid decline in the number of objects right around where the uh, <clears throat> end of fusion takes place. Is that purely a coincidence, or is there some fundamental reason why those two things should coincide? That's a very good question. And uh, to, to answer that, let me get back to that diagram. It's, there's probably a faster way of doing this. It, it appears nowadays that the, the, the uh, drop is not actually right where fusion takes place, but at slightly hotter, at, at slightly heavier masses. Uh, this happens at around spectral type N4 to N5 or so. Uh, a priori, no, there should not be a reason why those are connected especially since hydrogen fusion will not ignite until several million years in the formation process. Uh, the, the energy budget here is being dominated by energy released from gravitational collapse. So it is still a bit of a mystery what is going on here. Uh, that is why a lot of people were saying that brown dwarfs should vastly outnumber stars. In fact, when the WISE mission was, uh, had a press release, a pre-launch press release, they were so certain that brown dwarfs would outnumber stars that the subject of the press release is that we are launching the mission that will find the nearest object to Earth, closer than Proxima Centauri, because they figured the population would just be so dense that it, it was just trivial to assume that one of them would be closest. And they found the other way around. And we still don't understand this. Has anybody tried to explain that in anthropic terms? In the anthropic principle? Uh, well, uh, the universe has to be a certain way for us to observe. But we don't live in those stars. So, I mean, how, how would it, how would it affect us? I, I, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying that, you know, the characteristics of stars that would actually lead to our lives it could be, but this is, you know, somewhat disconnected from, from that. At least I don't, I don't see an obvious connection. We'll talk more about it later. Alan? Well, what you're really talking about is initial mass function of the star. Right? Yes. And so that's related, I think, very tightly to what's called the initial core mass function, where you look at the masses of small clumps of right. Do you see a connection between the the initial core mass function and the hydrogen burning limit? Yeah, you said exactly right. Yeah, okay. These, these things all happen well before fusion. Though. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it is it is true though that if you take the classical approach of the the genes mass, uh, how big a, a a clump needs to be in order for it to become gravitationally unstable, uh, you do get a result that uh, agrees very roughly to what we're seeing here. But again, the, the agreement would be coincidental with hydrogen burning. Well, yes. I published a paper by me to get down to about six super masses, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fragmentation. So the, the genes mass all by itself is not. The things can continue to fragment as you go to much higher densities once it starts collapsing. So you can break up even smaller objects. Mm -hmm. So just genes mass on a dense cloud core is not, not the whole story. Mm -hmm. Steve? Steve. So uh, not being an astronomer, I get to ask a really naive question. Mm -hmm. and I get like there's just a complete continuum in, 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 the, in 
So these molecular clouds tend to be uh, very large. You're dealing with uh, some of the simulations will start with 500 solar masses or so. Uh, but there, there are, uh, the, the, there could be clumpiness, yes. Uh, one particular question here is how does angular momentum get conserved during the collapse process? We know that higher mass stars are much more likely to be binary than uh, low mass stars. You have more matter coming in, uh, you can conserve angular momentum either through rotation of a single star or by making binaries. So uh, those things that do come in, yes. Uh, to answer your question uh, specifically, I think that what we see in the nearby disk population is the result of uh, many, many different star formation events. And I think that the, the, the scale of the phenomenon is large enough to, uh, to be homogenized by now. Yes, okay. that, that is true for a galactic disk age stars. If you look at uh, what's called moving group, specific moving groups, which are the, the remnants of these star forming regions, uh, you do get a lot more of the patterns you're talking about. trying to match the temperature of both. It's a triple but it's, system, right? It is a triple system. There is, so that was the A. Uh, so it's A, C, B. And so we're looking at A, C. And we are uh, matching. So in, in this range, in the Emdorf range, uh, the Barat 15, 2015 models worked fairly well. Uh, we could match both components. Uh, thus far, we've reduced uh, three uh, of those HST STIS components, and two of them we could match very well to the observations. This one also matches very well, but you need to use the isochrome for uh, 200 million years. Do you have data on the third system too? On the A? I mean, on the B? We don't have spectra for the B. However, we could. I, I believe we could get it from the ground. I, I forgot what the separation is, but I think it's it's enough that we could get it from the ground. And did you look for kinematic association with anything? Because uh, 200 million years. No, because I was going to ask you to do that. Okay. Because you <laughs> 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 so. okay. All right. Uh, one quick. So, so Serge, you pointed out the problem of having um, potentially close unresolved binaries. Yes, uh, for and, and, and that's a uh, I very briefly glanced over that slide. Uh, that is something I'd like to do for the Amdwarfs is to use MAGAO and uh, to expand those six systems for which we are doing HST spectroscopy with uh, MAGAO and just get the, the visible colors. Uh, for the L dwarfs, no, they're too faint. But for the M dwarfs, uh, there is a uh, a large sample of about 10, 15 of them that uh, I, once I get done with this spectroscopy project, I will use my Magellan tank towards Mega Eagle to do that. Do laser guys? But not at the depth. See, but, but, but then you, you don't have the optical part. You don't have the visible part. Uh, you, if they're separated by but more than about 0.2 arc seconds, then you could use SOAR with their ultraviolet laser. But like for seconds, then we really can't shoot that far. It's, yeah, I had that conversation. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, let's thank Serge again. He's here. He's welcome. <laughs>